All right, so this is lesson four. This is the last of the basics. Um, the next four are going to be a little bit more very specific process oriented. This is the last of kind of the overall how you do the basic things. Um, this is about effective delegation. I'm going to start off again with what I have here, which is a couple of snippets about the optional reading, primarily crazy bosses. Um, Stanley Bing, I should tell you that I love him. Um, you don't have to read the book. Again, this was purely optional, but I adore Stanley Bing. Um, he had such notable works as What Would Machiavelli Do? Throw in the Elephant, Zen, and the Art of Managing Up. And my personal favorite, Sun Tzu Was a Sissy, um, which teaches you how to be the crazy boss. So um, fascinating author, very funny, uh, very tongue-in-cheek. People react uh, very differently to his work. They either adore him and think it should be required reading that everybody should have for the rest of his life, or they detest him and see no point. Um, it's more about stories, and you need to glean what you want out of them. They're almost funny parables, to be totally honest. Um, I'm a big fan, if you can't tell. Um, crazy bosses. Um, if Douglas Adams didn't do Dilbert, he probably would have written this book. Um, it's a bunch of short stories, um, broken out, reviewing behaviors. Um, and basically, it breaks crazy bosses into a couple of things, but they all have some things in common. So if they're, it was a list, uh, the bully, the paranoid, the narcissist, the wimp, the self-destructive disaster hunter, which you see a lot in IT. Um, apart from it being good for a laugh, um, the fact of the matter is, is it does teach you a couple of things. One, crazy bosses, um, it depends on the viewpoint of the person, if they're crazy or not. Um, in IT, um, I'm a boss. Outside of IT and operations, they would call me a crazy boss. They would tell you I am absolutely bummies. I'm sure a few of you would too. But um, generally when you talk about a crazy boss, you're talking about people who almost by definition have an amount of authority or power in an organization that allows them to be quirky to the point of almost self-destructive depending. Um, give you a couple of examples of how, why, or what. Um, if you are one of two things, if you are absolutely irreplaceable, um, you can easily become a crazy boss. Um, you guys probably know my opinion on irreplaceable people is it's a very bad thing. Um, and anytime you can get rid of one, you should, because you should be cross-training. Um, Rockefeller um, said that he went through his businesses every week, found an irreplaceable person and fired them to ensure cross-training went on bit much for us, um, but it's a good example. Um, so they've either made themselves irreplaceable from the point of work, which is what Rockefeller was trying to go against, or they've made themselves irreplaceable politically. So this can be somebody that maybe once did an amazing thing for the company and the CEO now loves them. Uh, it could be somebody that has been 20 years on the staff of the COO and as such, people assume they are virtually unassailable. It could be somebody who's related to somebody, you know, somebody that married, you know, uh, one of the board members' kids. I mean, these things happen, and they happen everywhere. You're going to run into this all the time. What do you do? Pretty much nothing. You survive. You get by with them. You learn how to work with them. Because I absolutely promise you, um, any major corporation in North America is going to have one, two, or three absolutely ridiculously crazy bosses. It's important for you to recognize that it's not really the end of the world. And if you get mad and you get frustrated because you have to deal with one regularly, you're going to get up and you're going to leave and you're going to go to another organization. You're going to get a new job and go, aha, I got away from that jerk. And you are going to meet a brand new jerk. Um, they're everywhere. You just frankly have to learn how to deal with them and how sometimes to work around them, and that's pretty important. What's interesting, and this is a side note, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but it's a day in and in why, so we'll live with that. If you learn how to work around a crazy boss, a person who has almost too much power, almost too much authority, and their, their eccentricities, as it were, remember, because rich people are eccentric, poor people are crazy, right? Um, they're eccentric. Uh, if you learn how to work around them, you actually diminish them. 
um, they become less of a force in everybody's life. You actually improve the company by learning how to work around them, how to work with them, how to make things happen anyway. The more you do that, the less of a negative impact they'll have on your team. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It has absolutely nothing to do with that book. You won't see that in there anywhere, um, but it's legit. It's true. So I'm going to tell you a quick story, and then we're going to get on with this. I knew a crazy boss. Wasn't one of mine. Um, was a peer. Boss of a peer, actually. Um, this happened at Avaya many, many years ago because I'm old. Um, there was a revenue shortfall. We don't know what that's like, right? Um, there was a revenue shortfall at Avaya. And somebody said that we had to cut, and I don't know, something like uh, $2 million uh, had to be cut that quarter. There was a crazy boss. I will not say names because life's short and the world is small. Um, but this person was absolutely hilarious and a little bit nuts, and everyone knew it. So we walked into this meeting where we were all going to talk about where we were going to cut $2 million. At that meeting, it was done. And this person, and yeah, I'm desperately trying not to say gender or anything, this person stood up and said, I want you all to know you don't have to worry about it. I took care of it. Dead silence in this room. Every executive in North America of any, any impact is in this room. Silent. What have you done? Well, I decided I would take the hit for the entire $2 million so we didn't have to worry about it. One voice in the back of the room, not mine, said, and how did you do that? Well, I just fired all the engineers working on the new products. All right. She laid off that morning enough people to equal almost two and three quarter million, just under three million dollars worth of people. When you consider the average engineer back in that time was making maybe 80. Um, and then you add the usual, you know, 30%. And like I said, it was a long time ago. Those guys would be making a little more today. Um, probably 100 grand is an easy way to think about it. Point is, is she laid off about 25, 26 people. That was the majority of everybody that was working on what would become the Avaya Aura platform. One of the reasons Avaya almost completely fell apart is the ship dates or the newest version of the ACD, the Avaya Aura, what you and I refer to as 7.0, um, was delayed almost seven years, five years, seven years, something like that. It, it completely rocked it. It destroyed it. All the people that knew what they were doing and knew how they were going to do the new distributed model of ACD, the same thing Cisco did with the UCCE platform, were gone one day. Um, one of our senior vice presidents immediately called HR, you got to get these people back. She had given pretty, pretty good packages. They didn't want to come back. The few that we did get back, we had to hire at a significant raise, and they still got the packages. Anyway, that caused more money that needed to be cut. The entire thing was a fiasco, and it was all caused by one crazy boss, one person that had too much authority and not enough oversight, right? They're everywhere. I can't think of a company. I haven't run into one. I will not include my current company in that because I'm pretty sure that person is me. But I can't think of, apart from this current gig, anywhere where I didn't run into a handful, to be frank. I work for some pretty large companies. Um, they're always there. Work around them. Work with them. Find a way to get along and move on. And I know some of you are going to say, yeah, 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 but they've made mistakes. You know, we had this problem and that problem. <sighs> Mistakes happen every day. Crazy bosses make bad decisions every day. Uh, does anybody ever see that Dilbert cartoon where Dilbert was arguing about you know some horrible decision that was made, and the little pointy-haired boss said, "Yeah, but it's not going to change, you know, so we're not going to do anything about it. Let's just hold our neckties up until we can't breathe." Um, you're not going to change some decisions. Um, your leadership, including crazy bosses generally have a different view than you do and also different information and things that may look absolutely nuts at our level may not be nuts at the board level. So you've got to recognize you're not seeing the same information. Um, your job is to point out risks, um, not to lose your mind 
if a mistake is made. Mistakes get made by companies every day. What matters, of course, is that it isn't a mistake so large that it's going to put the company bankrupt. Um, but your only job is to point out the risks and then back up. If you fight a crazy boss, you're going to lose. You're not doing anyone any good, and you're just making them a little bit crazier because you're just one more opportunity for them to go outside of the lines, point out the risks, move on. That's life. Now, let's get into some coolness. We're going to talk about effective delegation. Um, that's not as straightforward a uh, conversation as you might think. I have rarely found anyone able to effectively delegate well all the time. I'm, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. Um, let me get a marker and we'll start this. By the way, someone stole most of the markers in my room again. So I immediately went back and stole all theirs. That's how it works. Um, effective delegation. It's not the same thing as being a strong boss. It's not the same thing as being the boss or the crazy boss or the pushy, super powerful guy or girl. Nothing to do with it. It's how to get things done effectively. That's not necessarily with force. Effectively, simply, it just works. That's really what you're going for. So let's talk about what you can do to be an effective delegator. Number one, and this is weird that I even have to point this out, drop the ego. Uh, I, I've probably pointed this out so many times over the year that it's a wonder I even have to think about it anymore. Drop the ego. You are not the only person who can do X. Remember, we've already talked about the fact that the reason you got promoted is because you were really, really good at something, and then we were really mean to you and we made you a leader. Oops, right? But even though you might have been the best, at one point I was an engineer no one could touch. Not anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm a piker these days, to be honest with you. I'm so far away from it. Um, but for a while, when I would try to delegate things, I would almost constantly tell them how they should do it. It's like my wife's rule with me and, and my rule back to her. You can tell me what you want me to do. You can tell me how you want me to do it. You can't tell me both. Um, it's frustrating. It's demeaning. It's belittling. The same way with your team. Drop the ego. Don't be the expert. I told you this last week. Don't be the expert. Create the expert. So if you're going to do delegation effectively, you have to treat them like they're capable of doing the thing and act as such. So don't think you're the only guy who can. Number two, this is weird as well. Be a leader. All right. What does uh, be a leader? All I'm really trying to say is don't micromanage. A manager will do that. A leader won't. I can't look over your shoulder all the time. I can't. And if I feel like I have to, are you in the right position or am I in the wrong position? Something's got to change. Someone's got to get trained. It may be you. Heck, it may be me. But micromanagement is death for effective delegation. No one will thank you for it. No one will appreciate you for it. And you will not succeed as well if you simply did number three, which is trust. I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Trust your team. If you can't make a change, you have to have people you can trust. And that doesn't necessarily mean skills. You can teach skills. You can train people up. You can raise people's ability to excel. But you have to trust them. And trust requires a certain convergence of culture. You have to really want this person on your team. You have to be comfortable with this person on your team. I hire people all the time that don't have the necessary skills. They're close, because I can't afford to start from zero nine times out of 10, but they're close, but they may not have it all. But what I'm really looking for is an outlook, a viewpoint, a work ethic, integrity, somebody that I can trust so I don't have to micromanage them. So those two are very much aligned. Here's where I'm going to lose some of you. No, the side effects of delegation. This, this one and the next one always make people scratch their heads when they first think about it. 
You cannot delegate something to someone on your team without knowing their workload, without knowing the particular clients they're currently working for. If I run up because I've got a fire drill because Chad had an attitude one morning, not that he generally has attitudes, but still, he comes up and says, Wayne, I want the thing, or I get a call from Pete, or I get a call from Don. I can't turn around to Jamie Bean and say, I need you to do this without knowing ahead of time, before I have the phone call, what it's going to do. And if I don't understand her workload and the things that she's doing, by the way, Jamie, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you. Uh, but if I don't understand the workload and the things that she's doing, I shouldn't call her. I shouldn't delegate this to her. I shouldn't give it to her. I'm not going to turn around to Art and say, Art, do this if I don't know what Art is in the middle of. You have to be connected to your team. That seems very basic, but you would be surprised how many people give something to someone, the newest fire drill, without realizing that by doing it, they were going to break this project that was very important for this particular shareholder, and then hell comes down. Let's talk about when the hell comes down. Number five, mistakes. Will, I'm going to write this really big, happen. When you delegate, things go wrong. They just do. And it's not just because you're the only person that thinks you can do it, right? Mistakes really do happen. Um, you know, you're, you're giving something to someone that seems pretty clear. To you, I'm trying to do A, B, and C. To their viewpoint, it may be B, C, D. It's just them looking at it differently than you would. Maybe you heard it from the sponsor differently than they wind up getting told. You know, we just went through a huge, well, I'm back to Jamie Bain. We just went through a huge n job. We had uh, Michelle Sugarman. Boy, did she do a phenomenal job on that. She really did. She did a great job. That project went through um, so smooth uh, that I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it never did. But right away, we realized, all of us did, um, that HR's idea of what would happen versus accounting's idea of what would happen they, they were far off. They were insanely far off. They would talk to one and they'd be happy. You'd go to the other. They'd be unhappy. You resolve it. You go back and how they're unhappy. I, you know, I, I think, uh, Jamie, I'm pretty sure you'd back me up on this. Michelle went back and forth 10, 15 different times before all of that was resolved. And even up near the end of the project, she kept doing it. Mistakes happen. Sometimes it's just viewpoints. Sometimes it's the, your, your particular stakeholder changes their mind. But what you think is going to occur when you give them the job isn't really what happens. So what do you do? A, there's going to be three subs here. You cannot be punitive. Do not get mad if it's new. If it's something that's never been done before. You can't be upset. You can't chew them out. You can't raise your voice. Don't let me catch you raising your voice. If you're delegating something to somebody that's brand new, you should have known that there was a good risk that this was going to happen. And to that point, B, you assigned it. This is going to be so different to what a lot of you have heard. You own the result. Most people would say resolution, same thing. I really want you to think about this. Before I give something to Jamie Vernon, before I give something to someone on my team, I have to recognize that if I, for whatever reason, can't do this myself, I'm getting drugged into a board meeting with the heck ever. God knows that's happened enough the last few months. Um, I have to recognize that he may go a little left. I have to recognize that he's not necessarily going to do what I want. If something's going to change, a stakeholder is going to get involved. And when I look at it, my first reaction is, that's not what I wanted. This just failed. Now, I need to step in. Now, here's where it changes. Here's the difference between a manager and a leader. A manager will come in and point at the person and say, you did this. You need to fix it. Don't let me hear that come out of anybody at this company. That's completely inappropriate. You delegated it because you got busy. You delegated it because you need help. You have to recognize that it may not come out the way you intended. And you own the resolution. If you had trained that person, if you had really understood 
what was going on in their job. If you had really interviewed the stakeholders and done your job correctly, they probably would have been set up for success. You delegated it because you ran out of time, because something else came up, because you had another priority, because somebody over you came down and said, do this thing. When you delegate, you have to recognize it may go wrong. And if it goes wrong, you should have already planned for what to do. Really can't say that strong enough. If I'm going to ask somebody on my team to do something and it doesn't work, I already have an idea what to do. I've already planned for it. So what I will do is I will go to that person and say, okay, that went off the rails. I want you to talk to so-and-so, change this and add that. Let me know when you're done. Come back to me. We'll make sure we're back on track. You never hear me say, well, figure it out. That is one of the most arrogant and obnoxious things a leader can do. Help. You helped cause the problem. You need to help fix it. Moving right along, what does this do? It reinforces your commitment. And frankly, your fairness. I don't usually like using the term fairness. Nothing's, nothing's fair. Uh, even handedness, I'm not sure. Um, come up with something that isn't necessarily that value laden with personal emotion, but it reinforces your commitment, your commitment to the job, to the team, and to the person. What I'm trying to tell you is if you immediately jump on somebody for doing something wrong that you delegated to them, as opposed to coming in with, got it, here's the resolution, let's go chase that down. If you come in angry, they never forget. Is that person going to be interested in doing the right thing going forward, you reckon? Or are they going to spend half the time on any future delegation covering their butts? CYA. I promise you it'll be CYA. So you come in knowing that you helped own it. You come in, you can be punitive. You come in with a resolution, and then you partner with them to get it back on track. That's a good boss. That's somebody that, frankly, they'll never forget. And the boss that yells, they get what they deserve. They get a team too scared to do anything going forward. Don't be that person. All right, moving on to six, and I'm gonna have to actually, I think erase some things here just so I have room today because we're covering some ground. I hope you guys take notes on all this stuff because Lord knows my writing is illegible. I just do this so I can think. Uh, moving on to six, when you're gonna delegate something, Ask politely. Has anybody caught on to the fact that I regularly call people Mr. or Ms. and by their last name and say please and thank you and all the rest of that jazz? It's not an affectation because uh, I'm, I'm Southern. Um, it's just general politeness. I don't tell Jamie Vernon to do a thing. I say, Mr. Vernon, if you could, I'd appreciate it if you do these things. Miss Bean, could you look into this? Can you get back with me on that? Art, can you blah, 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 blah. Politeness matters. You're going to get in a hurry. You're not going to be perfect. Sooner or later, you're going to say, hey, I need this done. Sometimes in an emergency or a fire drill, you have to say, get this done. It occurs. But your regular mode of communication should be polite. These are human beings. You've got to remember, we talked about this last week, you've got to remember the humanity of your team. And if you can't be polite, if you can't take the five seconds to be polite, you shouldn't be a leader. You shouldn't be in the position you're in. When I talk to Kevin Ahern, Mr. Ahern, can you? Mr. Ahern, can we? You should be that way to your team too. It's a very simple thing. It's a very small thing. Take the time to treat people with respect. Seven, effective delegation is just that. A leader delegates objectives. That's kind of important. I don't delegate tasks. I don't go to my team and say, call so-and-so. Never gonna. I don't say you've got to do this tiny little bitty thing. 
it doesn't mean you're not discussing task level stuff sometimes. I mean, I did this morning on a call. Sometimes you have to go through the particular output for a particular thing or audience. But in general, I'm going to come up to one of the people on my team, somebody who reports to me, and I'm going to say, hey, this thing isn't working well. This thing is broken. Can we fix that? Can we do something about that? Can you help me find a way to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not going to talk to somebody in finance. You know, I've got you know, Anne Marie is, is my finance partner, who I am blessed every day to have on my team. Um, I don't go to her and say, I need this and this and this and this. I don't get specific line item by line item. It's, can we find a way to be sure the costs go to the right place? Can you help me understand? You know, objectives as opposed to tasks. You start watching, and I promise you, the people that you work with that you respect a little bit less because it happens and we're humans, start paying attention. And you'll notice one of the things that bugs you is they task other people as opposed to giving them objectives. There's just something about that that just doesn't resonate well with people. And you'll notice it. And you'll notice that's one of the reasons why you go, hmm, when you talk to some of those folks too. So don't be that person. Moving right along, number eight. This is actually, should be self-evident, but it isn't. Train always and often. If you're going to delegate to people, you need to give them the tools. You need to give them exactly what they need to succeed. This goes back to some of what we were writing earlier. You know, if you, if you aren't giving them the training to do the job, you're surprised it failed. You've got to train constantly. You also, I mean, I guess part of it, I guess, is, is because we're in IT, we kind of have that culture of constant learning. You know, there's new technology, new ways to do things. Um, almost everybody in every group in our organization, our, our shared group here, our little family, is constantly learning more things about their very focused small thing. Um, you need to help with that. If somebody isn't, you know, studied up on the latest revision of, you know, X software or Y platform, um, get it for them. You know, find them a website, find a, 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 an afternoon or a web class or something. Um, but if I'm going to task somebody with, hey, I need you to do X on the network, I got to be sure their certifications are current and that it matters. Um, do it. Do it with sincerity. Mean it. Um, even if it's something that's just meeting once a week and talking about how you like to see things done. Even if it's something like this meeting with your team, have that meeting. Tell them how you like to manage. Tell them how you like things to work. Tell them how you like projects to move forward. Do exactly what all of us are doing right here with your team. But you've got to train. If you're expecting them to excel, you as a leader have to invest the time to help them excel. All right, number nine, be gracious. This goes back to, uh, you know, some of the, I'm noticing the screen keeps jumping. I hope that's not too distressing. Um, being gracious, being generous. We talked uh, last week about the coach's credo, you know, when, um, when it fails, it's because I failed as a boss. Uh, when it succeeds, it's because the team succeeded. It goes back to the same other things we used to talk about, which is, you know, you, you give people negative feedback or whatever the term you want to use today is constructive criticism, whatever the case may be, uh, you do that privately. But you praise publicly. Be gracious. Somebody does it. Somebody does a great job. Somebody goes out of their way. Say so. I do this weekly, and I insist my team does this weekly. Now, I don't necessarily do it with the people that report directly to me, and I'll tell you why. Because they're reporting to a C-level. They've achieved a level where they should not be looking for someone to praise them. They've achieved a level where they should be looking for people to praise their team. Let that sink in. It is wildly, wildly different. Kevin Ahern, sorry, Kevin, I'm picking on you. Probably, probably appreciates a kind word, but Kevin Ahern goes out of his way to send me the names of his team members who do a great job. He goes out of his way to do it. Frankly, most people on my team do on a regular basis, at least weekly. No, everybody does. True. 
but he goes out of his way. He makes sure. He'll even send me personal notes to explain exactly what so-and-so did and why it was so awesome, and then send the note that says, well done, guys. Sometimes in an email, sometimes on the 15.5, sometimes both, but he makes it a point. That's because at his level of leadership, he gets the high out of his team being praised. I don't have to send a note that says Kevin Ahern did a great job. I just have to say Kevin Ahern's team did a great job and he's tickled pink because that's where you should be. As a leader, you shouldn't be wanting to hear your name. You should be wanting to hear the name of your team. And if you're not doing that, you're doing something wrong. When I hear that all the guys and girls in our team did a phenomenal job, and by the way, they did in San Antonio, that's all I need. I don't need Ted to give me an award. I don't need him to pat me on the back. I don't need him to tell me, hey, Wayne, great job. Did you guys listen to our earnings call? Was everybody listening to our earnings call, our Q3? Not the happiest numbers we ever heard, but did you hear what Chad said at the end? He complimented IT. He mentioned in front of every investor we had what a great job IT did in launching San Antonio. Amazing job. And, of course, he made a smart remark about the fact that we now have to launch every site in two weeks. Talk about things that won't happen. But he, he basically said what a great job IT did. I didn't need to hear my name. I don't want to hear my name. I heard that our team did a great job. I was high. I loved that. I was just smiling ear to ear, couldn't stop smiling because it was a compliment to the team. That's how you need to think. If you're still waiting for people to say that you did a good job, stop being a manager. You need to hear that the team did a good job. That's what a leader looks for. That's what should make you high. Think it through. All right. Last but not least, you're thinking this, you're going to think this one's silly, but it's not. Start now. I absolutely promise you, I wish the screen would be doing that. I absolutely promise you, you don't always delegate correctly. Nobody does. You have to make yourself do it. You need your weekly reset, guys. I've hit it every single one of these conversations. You need your weekly reset. Am I living up to what I preach? Because you'll always fall away. You have to make yourself consistently improve. Constantly, consistently, every week. You need that half hour to think through it. This is why you may delegate great to these three people. What about the other four? This is where most leaders fail. They have two or three people maybe four at the most, that they trust implicitly. You could probably think of who they are off the top of your head. The people in your team that are your go-to people. I know absolutely so-and-so can do this. At my level, if I can't trust everybody that reports to me, i got a bigger problem. But if you step down a level, you're going to have your favorite. The ones that you know always come through, you'll probably promote them. But if you've got a handful of other people, as most do, so you're not the Lone Ranger here, and you're not delegating the same way to them, you, I want to repeat this, you are doing these people a disservice. It is your job as a leader to make sure they're trained up to where they can do it. It is your job as a leader to give them the same respect and the same trust you're giving the others. And if you can't, you have a larger problem. Is a major retrain involved or is it required? Is a change? require? Do you need to manage them up or manage them out? Or do you just need to stop and realize that you're not putting yourself out for them the way you do these others? You're not managing your team evenly. This is a mistake. You need to be able to trust everybody on your team. So start now because I promise you you're not doing it with everybody. If you are, by the way, more power to you and I'd like to talk about it because I've never seen it in 25 years. I've never seen it. Think that one through, all right? So start now. You probably want to remember the story of the fighter pilot. I'm going to end with this. I always have a stupid saying somewhere, you know. I worked for a guy many years ago 
amazing fellow, amazing fellow. And he watched me get a little full of myself. I know you can't believe that I would ever do that. He watched me get a little full of myself. And he asked me the damnedest question one time. He said, Wayne, and I said, yeah, who cleans our toilets? It was one of those questions that you just didn't see it coming. It came out of nowhere. Oh, bam, you know, I'm hit. And I went, um, a cleaning service? The wrong answer. His name was Andy some such. It's been quite a few years. Um, but he told me the guy's name. And he told me his life story. Holy crap. I had really just spent my time learning the names of the people that had a direct and powerful impact on me. Here's the Lord muck-to-muck of the whole place. <sighs> Learn the name of the guy that scrubbed the toilet. Um, well, you talk about setting me back on my heel. I, I realized immediately what he was telling me. How full of myself was I? I was only paying attention to the people I thought could directly affect my career. Whoa, what a mistake. What a terrible mistake. Let me tell you something. The guy who scrubs toilet at home office here, his name is Ramundo. I learned my lesson. I call him Ray. Great guy. He parks in our parking lot 4 a.m. every morning, and he sleeps there for about an hour and a half. Why? Because he has several family members that he drives to their jobs to also clean places. And he drops them off early, and he has hours to wait before his shift starts. So he goes to sleep in our parking lot for an hour and a half to two hours, depending. And then he comes through and takes everything. everything. I mean, Ray's a great guy. Uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know him. I learned that lesson. Have you? You need to. Okay, the way he described it to me, he said, Wayne, you're a fighter pilot. Wow, what a nice brush for my ego. You're a fighter pilot. The guy that swaps the deck is the only reason you get to take off. Pay attention to everyone. Pay attention to everyone on your team. Everyone and everyone else's team. You got to understand that at the moment that plane is about to take off, the most important person on the aircraft carrier was the guy that swabbed the deck. Because if he didn't do it right, this guy's going in the ditch. He's done. So as you're coming through, you got to remember that everybody on your team needs to be treated the same way. Everybody's important. Any position, anywhere. Do you know the name of the person who cleans up after you? Learn the name of the person that cleans up after you. They swab the deck. They're just as important as you are. All right. That's this week. I think next week it's, ooh, time management. Hey, you guys need to be ready to take some freaky notes next week. We're leaving the basics. We're going to specifics. It's going to be fast and it's going to be furious for the next four. Then after that, it turns into strategy and slows down again. Um, but the next four, you'll need to take notes very, very quickly. Um, this is time management as a leader. It is a completely different thing from probably most of the things you've seen before. Uh, I was blessed, blessed to learn this uh, by somebody who had a heck of an impact on me, Brad Sonnenberg. Uh, I'll tell you a story about him next week. As far as the reading, I think it's Emotional Intelligence QuickBook. Um, I think the name of the person is Bradbury. I have it over there. Um, this one's important. This one's important. If the one minute manager taught you um, the basics of interacting with people who report to you, and that's really what it's all about, parables and such. Um, the Emotional Intelligence QuickBook helps you deal with people that are a little more extreme in personality. So it's not the basics. It's more how to deal with significant issues and how to have more tools in your quiver to deal with those busier, more problematic issues, and sometimes those busier, more problematic people. Um, emotional intelligence is, is important. There's got to be about 70,000 different books on the subject. I swear, every time you look through Amazon, there's more. Um, but this one, I think, is frankly a really a good one. Uh, emotional Intelligence QuickBook, I think 2.0 um, was the one I read. Uh, I know there's other versions. Uh, it's probably the one I like the most. Pick whichever one you want. They're all pretty close and we'll talk through it. Now, does anybody have any questions before uh, I let you go? Going once, going twice, going three times. All right, you guys have a great weekend.
We'll see you Monday, and we'll see you back here in a week. Remember, it's going to be Friday morning. I'm going to find a time. Uh, don't worry, it won't be 8 o'clock. Um, but I'll find a time, and uh, we'll reset it up. Thank you very much, everybody. Talk to you soon. Have a good one, team.